Okay, it's now 8 o'clock, and welcome to the Smartphone Non-Productivity Webinar. My name is Francis Wade, and I'll be hosting the webinar this evening. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of who I am, in case you haven't met me in one place or the other. Um, I'm a management consultant, and I operate the two-time management, also called the Time Management 2.0 blog. I happen to have a background in operations research, which I guess I've applied to the whole problem of time management and how to improve the way in which we manage our time. Given that there are smartphones and cell phones and all sorts of new technology that's entering the, the marketplace, entering the professional world. If you hear an accent, it's because I'm, I'm living in Jamaica. I returned to live here five years, after, five years ago after living in the States. And um, what's interesting about Jamaica is that we actually have a 116% cell phone penetration rate. And that's versus 89% in the U.S. So there are a lot more Jamaicans using cell phones than there are in the U.S. And people ask, you know, how could it be 116%? Well, it's simple. Many Jamaicans have two or even three cell phones or smartphones um, with, from the three major providers that we have, have here on the island. I myself have a cheap cell phone. I, I gotta say, I got, I got the cheapest cell phone I could get um, a couple of years ago when um, my primary cell phone got wet and then I got fed up and said I'm not spending any more money on these things. Um, but the fact that I live in Jamaica and I have a cheap cell phone means that I um, notice some unusual things. And one of the usual things I've noticed has to do with my own choice at some point in the near future to upgrade to a smartphone. So I will definitely make the upgrade. Question is, what am I going to upgrade to? Hmm. Okay, I'm just checking one of the settings here to make sure my screen is, is showing. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, just in case you're wondering, there is actually a poll that's currently um, underway. If you go down to the polls, there's five questions I'm putting, uh, asking you tonight to answer at some point. I'm going to be addressing um, or updating you on the progress of those five questions at the end of the evening, tell you what, answer, what the answers look like. But here we go. Um, so here's what one thing I noticed when I was traveling through LaGuardia Airport in about 2007. Ran across this fellow who was, he had both of his hands in the air. He had both of his hands on his, um, I think it was a Blackberry, and he was at a urinal. Now, I tell you, that happened three years ago, but it's still stuck in my mind. Uh, hygiene aside, you know, what, what mindset did he have? What rush was he in? So much so that he couldn't wait two minutes to send a text. And ever since I saw, saw that happen, I've been wondering, you know, what's the mindset or the fear that's driving that particular behavior? And uh, it's obviously not productive. I mean, it's unhygienic, but it's obviously not productive. So what would have someone who's obviously a trained professional on his way to a business meeting, stop what he's doing, and engage in a habit that's obviously a bad habit to engage in? I bet you if somebody said to him, Hey, I saw you. I saw you the other day in the bathroom. What were you doing? I bet you the guy would feel embarrassed. Well, I think there are a couple, a couple of big forces that are currently pushing us towards this kind of behavior. One is that there's a recession on the way. You know, here in here in the Caribbean, we're we're very much used to hurricanes, and um, it's actually our hurricane season at the moment. And I, I liken it to sort of two things happening at the same time: the darkness that's coming from a recession, the dark kinds of clouds, and the new technology that we often see, um, I'd say it's described as lightning in this picture, but the combination of the recession and new technology are sort of two huge forces that we don't have any control over as individuals, but they're making a tremendous difference to what's happening um, in the world around us. So I mentioned this business about fear. A lot of fear is being driven right now by what's happening because of the recession. But a lot of it is coming from other places. Recent survey said 30% people responded said that they needed to stay connected at work 24-7, even during weekends, breaks, or holidays. 
also to go with that, 24% feel as if they have to stay connected to their work during their time off. Otherwise, they'd be seen as less committed to their jobs. You know, I'll tell you a joke. I often mention that LaGuardia story and seeing the fellow at the urinal in my time management programs. Earlier this year, I did a program with some executives. And, you know, we all had a good laugh, which always happens. People shake their heads. How could that happen? That couldn't happen to me. Um, and I'll tell you, about a half an hour later, I was actually in the bathroom and I saw an executive doing exactly the same behavior. And I said, hey, what are you doing? And he sort of jumped and said, oh, oh my God, I can't believe it. We had a good laugh. But there is a fear of, in the deep background of losing either one's job or one's status or something that's important. And that's driving us to some of these behaviors that we know aren't productive, even when we know better. I mean, we had just discussed you know, this particular habit 20 minutes before, and here he was actually doing it. The other big move is that um, big, and I mentioned that there were two of them. One is the recession, the other is technology. By 2011, we fully expect that some 50% of Americans will have access to smartphones. In other words, we're well on our way to 100%. Can you imagine your workplace, 50% of the people using smart mode, smartphones? Can you imagine it being 100%? be a very different kind of place. So I'm going to imagine that you came to this call either because you're someone who has smartphone habits that perhaps you've tried to break, perhaps you've only become aware of, but smartphone habits that you don't want, you know, like this guy on the right. Or maybe you've come to this call because you're working with someone like this guy on the right of the picture. Or maybe you're someone who is in a relationship with someone like the guy on the right. Or maybe you're someone who is otherwise affected, suffering from, having to live with smartphone habits that take people away from you and damage the productivity of those around them. So I'm going to speak to you as someone who might be a smartphone user, might not be, might have bad habits, might, but you are in the world where you're affected by it. And here are some of the effects that I discovered in my survey. Um, as you probably know, I had a survey running for the last uh, couple of weeks or so, and I found out that 90% of those who responded have texted while driving. 80% have interrupted meetings to go to their smartphones. 85% have used their smartphone in a bathroom. 97% have used a smartphone on vacation. 65% have used a smartphone between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. 75% actually want to change their smartphone habits to some degree. Many don't know how. Hmm. Bottom line is, I, I gathered from the survey that people love the technology, but they hate the bad habits. And that, that goes for people who have smartphones, don't have smartphones, abusing smartphones, not abusing smartphones, love the technology, hate the bad habits that have developed as a result of smartphone technology. At the end of it all, you know, those who responded to the survey, and maybe you on the call, there's something you want to escape from. Either something that you brought on or something someone else has brought on. But it's not just as easy as wanting to escape. There's some sort of formidable boundaries. And that's what tonight is all about. How do you change your environment and yourself so that you can't escape. Hmm. And why is change necessary? Well, there's going to be a point real soon, not 2011, but perhaps not too long after, when there will be 100% smartphone use or acceptance. So 100% of the people in your company are going to be using smartphones. Bet you can't wait, huh? <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, I, I, it, it, obviously, to us now, driving while texting is a bad idea. It's extremely unproductive. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of energy, it's a waste of effort. And it's a serious risk to those who are in the car as well as those who are out. But there can never be enough laws to protect us from all of the behaviors that I listed before. You know, the, most, the worst of the behaviors is no 
banned in several countries, not in Jamaica, not, not in, in any country in the Caribbean that's independent. There's lots of people driving who are still texting. But there can never be enough laws to protect you and your company from the lack of productivity that comes from these bad habits. So instead of looking to pass more laws, which probably wouldn't work, we need a new productivity. We need a new way to think about how to be effective using the new technology. We need a way that's safe, thoughtful, but also has a modicum of good manners. Jeez. So here are my three, three uh, sort of subtopics for the evening on how to execute the change in your life, in your company, the people that you work with, people that you work for. Here's how you execute the change. First thing, you assist the individual. And if you're the individual that we're talking about tonight, how do you assist yourself? The second is that you need to insist on real productivity. I'll define what that means later. And the third is that you need to challenge executives even if they're your clients. So if you don't report to anyone, chances are you do, however, have clients who do have some power in your lives. So those are the three steps we're going to go through tonight. So let's start with the be at the beginning. Where do, you, where do you and how do you assist the individual? Well, here's where we start. First thing that we acknowledge is that productivity is based on habits. Habits are simply automatic behaviors that we have no control over. They operate on their own. At some point, we decided to start them, and they're no run without any gas from us. Many are unconscious. But importantly, habits are neutral. Neutral in the sense that they're, they're not good or bad. And certainly, the habits that are, that are used around smartphones weren't good or bad when they were first implemented. Matter of fact, they were absolutely well-intentioned. You know, like, like for example, the habit of answering the phone when it rings, you know, before it goes to voicemail. It's a good habit that probably you developed when you were 15 years old or 13 years old. Um, probably developed it in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Good habit. Doesn't work in the smartphone era, however. Hmm. So the first thing to acknowledge is that productivity is based on habits. And that habits are a peculiar kind of creature. When it comes to productivity and time management systems, habits happen to be the building blocks. But the good news is, habits are actually the building blocks of many things in our lives, including our happiness, whether or not we exercise, our relationships, how well we parent. It's all about habits. But to circle right back, time management systems are built on habits. Habits that we happen to have taught ourselves. So if we're looking to change the way we work with smartphones or help other people to change the way they use smartphones, we've got to look at their time management system and the habits that comprise those systems. Okay. So here's a story so far. The typical professional who's at the workplace, uh, probably still at work right now. You were enjoying your life until about 1993 when some person invented email and, and then before you know it, 1996, everyone had an email address. Somewhere around 2007, email became portable and you got a smartphone. So now you could check email from anywhere. So now email actually traveled with you along with voice, IM, text and so forth. Then a recession came, 2009, introduced some urgency and some fear. And what you've discovered, perhaps, or many have learned, is that their old habits simply stopped working. The old habits that they used to use before the days of email, smartphones, and the recession stopped working. The so bigger forces took over, and now a certain level of unproductivity has taken place. And we want to escape. So that's the average, average person's story. The average person who works in a corporation. Hmm. So, the key is to start by looking at your current habit pattern. That's the place to start. So, looking at your current habit pattern, and if you were to look at just your sort of time management skills, it's a little like looking at your hand. And for most of us, if you look at your hand right now, what you see is flesh, uh, some creases in the palm, some hair on the outside on the back. I have a couple of scars couple wrinkles, some nails, and you know, my hand looks that way from the outside. 
But to really understand why my wrist is hurting, I need to look a lot deeper than just the outside. I need to look, look a lot deeper than just the problem I'm having with my smartphone. I need to look, in case of my hand, at uh, an x-ray. So an x-ray tells me where my wrist is sort of not functioning the way I want to. The same way, you need to look at your current habit pattern. The way in which your time management system is currently assembled. As I said before, you put it together at some point in, in the past, probably starting when you were 13 or 14. Unfortunately, the time management system that you built for yourself wasn't built for the smartphone hero. However, when you understand how your habits were put together, what the current system is that's been operating sort of below the flesh, below the surface, the story that I shared before, you know, about email, smartphone, recession, 2009, the story actually makes complete sense. Hmm. But it starts with needing to understand your current habit pattern. When you don't understand your current habit pattern, it's a little like trying to fix you know, a sprained wrist without doing x-rays. You tend to look in the wrong places. A lot of people are looking in the wrong places when it comes to improving the way in which they use their smartphones and the way in which they try to get rid of bad habits around their smartphones. They look at things like information overload. So there are some people who think that the internet has just gotten to be too big. They're getting too much email, too many websites, too many channels on TV, too many ways to get a hold of me, too much voicemails, too much IMs, too many, too many Skype messages and so on and so forth. Hmm. Some people think it has to do with too much technology. And you need to dial it back somewhere around 1987 where there was no such thing as email. And there was just paper. Hmm. Some people think that you just get rid of your management because they're the ones who are forcing us into these bad habits. Hmm. Some people quit jobs because they think it's a function of their job. Unfortunately, what they don't know is that when they change their job, whatever job they go to at this point, it's 2010, chances are, some point in the future, Smartphones are going to track them down and fill up the workplace that they move to because there's going to be some point at which we have 100% usage of smartphones. Some people blame Steve Jobs, Research in Motion or RIM, guys who make Blackberries. Some people blame Microsoft because there's nobody else to blame. Some people blame their current smartphone and they say, you know what, this Blackberry isn't working for me. I need an Android instead. So they go out and they purchase a new smartphone. Thing is, when you don't understand your current habit pattern, you go looking for answers in all the wrong places. Sometimes spending money. But those solutions don't work. Because what's underlying every possible option, all the ones that I've listed above, is your current habit pattern. The one that you've used to produce results that you put together over the last 10, 20, 30 years of your working life. So I'm going to make a boast here. I only know of one way to understand your current habit pattern. And that's through one of my programs. No, that's going to sound boastful. But I've been looking for the last four years to find anyone else who, who offers a way to understand your current habit pattern. Before even talking about improving it. I haven't found anyone yet. Tonight I'm going to be focusing on My Time Design 1.03. A way to understand your current system your current way of managing your time, managing your email, managing your smartphone use, so that you can then begin to talk about improvements. I hope I'm not the only way, by the way, the, the only single person that will ever come up with a way to understand current habit patterns and your current time management system. But so far, I don't know of any others. So at the end of the evening, I'm going to give you a way to sign up for My Time Design 1.0 Stay tuned, that's coming up uh, in a later slide. So your current habit profile is something that you establish in My Time Design 1.03. Any of you who are familiar with the um, recovery um, movement, you know, uh, AA or Narcotics Anonymous, know that one of the things that they talk about is doing a fearless inventory. Well, in My Time Design 1.03, you actually do a fearless inventory of the habits that make up your current time management system. 
So I'm going to assume that if you're on this call, you're someone who's had a certain degree of success in your life. You probably did well on your SATs, your school leaving exams. You did well at college. Maybe you have an advanced degree. But you've gotten to the point where you've accomplished a great deal in life. And your current habit pattern is what got you to this point. So you've been a success. What you can discover in My Time Design 1.03 is what that profile looks like. Because most of us set habits in motion and then forgot. Most of us weren't taught how to develop these habits. We kind of learn them bit by bit from teaching ourselves. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that when a new technology comes along, it becomes important. See, the thing is, each person's profile is different. And this is the reason why not everyone benefits from purchasing a BlackBerry. Some do, some don't. Not everyone purchases for, uh, benefits from buying an iPhone. Not everyone benefits from uh, managing reading all their email every day. Each person's habit pattern is different. So you have to spend some time to discover your own habit pattern before getting into the question of what technology do you use. So here's why the knowledge is important. Knowledge of your own habit pattern. Well, fact is, today we're talking about smartphones. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about something completely different. Something probably unrelated. Some new technology that's going to blow the current technology out of the water. When you understand your habit pattern, you can then apply new technology confidently, knowing that your understanding of your habit pattern and your time management system the way in which you manage your time now, the way in which you're productive now, would benefit from this new technology. It's kind of like if you own a car. I remember I owned a car, I think back in about 1990, so 1983 Toyota Corolla SR5. And one day I went to you know, go and change the carburetor. <laughs> it's a bad idea because I didn't know anything about cars. All I had was this shop book, you know, a book with all the diagrams, and I bought the kit from... Pet Boys, it's just an auto store, and I, I, I sat down on Saturday, Sunday. Sunday night, the car wouldn't work. I had no business trying to install a carburetor because I didn't understand the way in which engines worked. That's the same way in which one of the worst gifts you can give someone is a smartphone. Why? Because they'll adopt it without understanding or knowing how their current habit pattern would benefit from that particular technology. When you do have that understanding, then any new technology that comes along, you can assess kind of coldly, slowly, but confidently and answer the question, how does this make me more productive? Similar to the way in which you know, other productivity technologies have come into our lives. You know, I, I remember when I, maybe I was about five years old, my mother said, you know, if you tie a string around your finger, you won't forget. That's the first technology I was introduced to. But then there's been others over the years. But the, the thing to get is that you know none of them was perfect. Some were good for some habits, but they're awful for others. So for a five-year-old, tying a string on a finger was a pretty good habit at the time. Bad habit for a 40-something-year-old. At some point, I was introduced to to-do lists. At some point, I had a daytime or a, a day runner. At some point I got a PDA and now I'm at the next one which is I'm thinking about getting a smartphone. Fact is something new is always coming along. This time I'm doing it differently however. As I move to a smartphone I'm asking myself the question how will that impact my current habit pattern? Which habit pattern will that improve? Which habit will that make a difference in? Because as I said before none of these technologies is perfect. None of them is the final answer. They're good for some habits, and they're awful for others. Thing is, we need to pick through them intelligently and carefully. That's the only way to be effective. So this isn't just a matter of answering the right, you know, the right advertisement. So uh, you know, I've loved the iPad advertisements, and uh, the friends of mine have shown me their iPads, and oh my God, they're, they, they look awesome. Strategically picking the right technology is a matter of productivity and your peace of mind. It's not about entertainment. It's not about envy. It's not about 
what I call pseudo convenience. It's not about relieving your boredom. It's not about being cool, and it's not about being sexy. It's unfortunate. But picking a new technology isn't about those things when it comes to productivity. And if you pick them for those reasons, you could easily damage your own productivity and dent your peace of mind. In other words, you could end up in a bathroom with a smartphone. You could end up texting while driving. You could end up interrupting meetings and conversations, reaching reflexively for your smartphone, and annoying a lot of people who are around you. So I don't want to be accusatory, but I do want you to, to, to understand a bit why and where these habits come from. And also, to have a little bit of compassion for people who are stuck with habit patterns that they can't get rid of. You know, they bought the iPhone because it was sexy. And they developed bad habits without understanding their habit pattern. A lot of people fall into the trap. And I've got to say, this is the number one selling point when it comes to smartphones and all the newest and latest ones that I've seen. It's what I call pseudo-productivity. So pseudo-productivity consists of being able to call your mother and say, look ma, I can, and then we pick an item from the left column, while I'm, and you pick a column, uh, uh, an item from the right column. So it's just a fill in the blank exercise. Look ma, I can take a picture while I'm skiing. Look ma, I can watch TV while I'm kneeling in church. Look ma, I can send a text while I'm proposing marriage and so on and so forth. This kind of pseudo productivity is the reason that I've been given why smartphones make people more productive. More productive. I call this a matter of doing stupid stuff in strange places. So people justify their need for a new smartphone. Why? Because I can get to do some real stupid stuff in some really strange places. That's not the kind of productivity I'm talking about. Although that is the kind of productivity that you see in advertisements. And it is the kind of productivity that people use to justify why having a smartphone is a must. And why you should get one too. <laughs> so, above and beyond the whole business of focusing on the individual, if you're interested in transforming not just your life, but the life of those around you, maybe in your company or in your family, you've got to keep your eye on what I call real productivity and away from pseudo-productivity. So you remember a time when lines in banks were reshaped. Remember the time when each teller used to have its, uh, their own separate line. And then at some point, some smart person came along and said, it's much quicker to have one line rather than 10 separate lines. And I remember there was a raging debate at the time. And I happened to have been a student. Um, as I mentioned before, I was a student in operations research. That's where I got my, my two degrees. I remember a professor saying to us that, you know, people ask and they, they, they ask questions like, was it because of it's better etiquette? Somehow it's better manners to be in one line rather than others, than many? Is it a hygiene issue? Is it that we, you know, we want to have people all together and not, not spread out over the bank so they can spread their germs to the tellers? I don't know. Keep, keep the customers away? Was it because we wanted to foster community and keep everybody together doing the same motion and not jump from line to line and feel a sense of envy of other people who were um, other people who were in the other lines because you know the other line seems to be going faster. <laughs> well, people, you know, the debate sort of raged on, and I remember our professor explaining to us that it had nothing to do with these things. This happened to be my professor in a class that I did on queuing theory. And uh, he said, there's only one reason, is that it's quicker and it's more productive. So I don't want to go into all the reasons why that's so, but it is true. One line is more productive than several small lines. Why? Because it's quicker, quicker, it saves money, it saves customer time, it saves teller time, it saves waste. So we're talking about a bottom line benefit. Companies who put this in place, in other words, use less tellers. Simple. Lowering their costs.
Hmm. So real productivity. When I say we need to focus on real productivity, I'm asking you, in other words, to focus your attention away from etiquette, hygiene, or social skills. So, you know, in this picture, I have a fellow who wants to take that Blackberry and he want, or iPhone and he wants to throw it in the garbage because his girlfriend is spending more time talking to her friend than she is talking to him. Hmm. Bad etiquette. So most of us complain, you know, that you know these smartphones are rude and that they need to be people need to take a class in order to go back to some essential skills or on how you manage yourself with other people. They need to review their social skills and, and so on and so forth. Well, you need to not focus on that and instead focus on, especially if you're in a company, dollars, cents, waste, effort, time, real productivity. When it comes to challenging unproductive habits, the survey I did, 75% of those who responded said something needs to change in their workplace. In other words, 75% of the workplaces that were polled in the survey I did said that something needs to change and that things can't continue. Now they may have been complaining about the etiquette, the hygiene and the bad social habits, but I think that people are cluing into that something's not right here. Something's being wasted. But what is it? How do you even get to it? Now here are some ways. One is if you're in a meeting and someone is, gets on their phone and starts talking, you say stop. If they hold their hand to you and say, no wait, wait, I'll still be there, one second. You say stop. Stop the meeting. And you come up with some ground rules. I worked in a telecom company back in 2000. 2000. Um, it was in Latin America. And cell phones had just been popularized at the telephone, tele telecom company. Everybody had a cell phone. And it was the most amazing thing because one of the habits that came from having a cell phone is that everyone kept their cell phones on and everyone answered every call. I don't think there was call waiting back then. Which meant that if you were presenting to a group and your cell phone went off, you answered it. So the first habit you need to address, which was never addressed at that company, is the habit of telling people to stop and confronting the behavior when it happens. Having the courage to stop other people from doing what, the kind of behaviors, engaging in the kind of behaviors that are ruining your productivity and the productivity of the company. That's not easy, but it's a must. The other habit that I thought of that you could start is to refuse to continue. You know, when you're speaking with someone, and you know you can see their attention start to drift and it drifts to their smartphone and they their hand goes to the smartphone and then they start just looking for email to respond to they start sort of you know the thought crosses their mind that they haven't checked their email in a long enough time so they know you know start to check to see what kind of email they might have gotten while they were talking with you. It's to stop and to refuse to continue. Refuse to continue the conversation. Hmm. If you belong to an organization, I have some tips, some further tips. One is there's a wonderful book that I use called Switch. It's a tremendous book. That, uh, it's the, it was put out by the, the authors of um, made to stick but they're also the guys who put out Wired magazine. Um, it's all about how to make change happen in companies. Strongly recommend it. But the other strong recommendation I have is that you get HR involved. Why? The changes I'm talking about represent a huge culture change. It's a huge change to change the habits that each person will one day engage in when they get a smartphone. Not just for the sake of their own safety, but also for the sake of the bottom line of the company. Unfortunately, I'm yet to meet an HR expert or vice president or director who has this particular issue on their radar. Not sure why. I mean, typically HR, HR um, professionals tend to be a bit technology averse. 
But in this case, the technology has already come in through the executive suite and it's being popularized at all levels of the company. People's behavior is changing. Productivity is suffering as a result. I don't know that HR is doing much about it. Just a reminder that I do have four of the questions still open uh, in our poll. So if you have a moment, just go over to the poll and just answer, answer the questions that we have there. So the third point is to challenge executives. So the first point is to address the individual, give them a way to understand their current habit pattern. Second thing I mentioned is to engage in the transformation of the company, deal with the habits as they spread across the entire, um, the entire set of employees in the workforce, knowing that all of them at some point would own smartphones. And then the third is to challenge executives. Now, if you don't have executives, as I said, you should think of your clients. Now, why do I say you have to challenge executives? Well, unlike other technology tools, this one is a bit different. Smartphones are personal tools. And if I were to point the finger, I would say most of them, most smartphones, entered companies through the executive suite. For whatever reason, probably because of the expense, they were the first to enjoy using them. Unfortunately, they were also the first to start to cut corners. So when it came to safety, hygiene, etiquette, and ultimately productivity, your CEO and the other executives were probably the first to whip out their smartphone and send a text when they were driving. They were probably the first to interrupt a meeting by you know, spending the whole time on a smartphone sending a text. You know, I remember a company, a client of mine, um, uh, they had a presentation on the communication strategy at this company, a company that spread across many countries. Critical piece of business. And the person who made the presentation came back to me and I asked her how it went. She said it was awful. I said, why? She said the CEO spent the whole time on his BlackBerry. The entire hour, his head was down in what they call the BlackBerry preposition, sending text messages and emails back and forth, spending almost no attention, putting no attention on the presentation and sending a huge message to the rest of the company. Hmm. So under time pressure, executives in your company or your clients if you have them are probably the ones who began with these habits and actually put these habits to play. And sure enough, the employees followed. So they saw their executives, the way in which they use their smartphones, and they followed right in. Hmm. Um, by the way, just as an aside, um, please, um, you can submit any questions that you have for me because we're going to have time for questions at the very end. So if you have any questions, just open up the questions section and then um, we'll get to them at the very end. So employees simply followed the example of CEOs. And when we get to 100%, it's predictable that they'll do the same. The big difference, of course, is that when employees get their smartphone, and follow their CEO's example, they don't get the same pay. They probably initially won't have the same commitment to work the same long hours, weekends, vacations, holidays that executives do. They have very different contracts to work or different agreements around what times they need to be available to others in the workplace. They have less power and they will use their smartphones with a great deal more fear. So the habits might be the same, like for example, interrupting a bar mitzvah to check email right in the middle of it. But the impact on someone who's not paid the same, has less power and is also more fearful, will be very different. So where we're headed to is a sort of very dangerous place. When smartphones become ubiquitous, we'll hit the 50% mark in the US in 2011. Here in Jamaica, I think it could be beyond 50% if there was more disposable income to purchase smartphones. At some point in the future, we'll all hit 100%. And then what? Hmm. 
And when there's a smartphone in every pocket and in every purse, will the unproductive habits that we've seen displayed in the boardroom simply spread? Then what will happen to the bottom line of our companies? I expect that there'll be way more of that pseudo productivity doing stupid stuff in strange places. But here's an interesting conundrum. Where is more time wasted? Is it the CEO who spends an hour on her Blackberry? Completely misses a presentation, undermines the presenter, and sends a message that what's being presented is unimportant? Or is it that employee who comes to work five minutes late? I'm going to tell you something. You know, we know how to quantify the effect of a employee who comes to work five minutes late, ten days a month. You know, there's all sorts of formulas and ways of computing the time lost. The people actually call it time stealing because it's as if the employee is stealing the time away from the company. Kind of funny that way. Hmm. But we have no idea how to quantify the impact of a CEO on her BlackBerry for an hour during a meeting with other executives. I have a suspicion that the CEO on the BlackBerry and the hour is way more expensive than the employee who even gets to work four hours late. But that's not measured. I haven't found a, a single uh, study on anywhere in my searches, on my research uh, research on the internet. Believe me, I put it up on my blog and I'd be blogging about it and writing a paper on it, but there's nothing, nothing that I've found. It's as if we have our attention on all the wrong things. Hmm. And what I'm talking about is a bottom line dollars and cents issue. We're talking about money. We're talking about waste. We're talking about an impact impact that can be measured but just isn't being measured yet partly because the awareness isn't there and partly because nobody knows how to we have a saying in my business that the dead fish stinks the worst at the head well this is certainly a case of that responsibility for reversing the smartphone habits smartphone unproductiv unproductivity that I've been talking about really does start at the top and let me tell you something, there are some CEOs who would refuse to give up their favorite habits, their favorite smartphone habits, who would be unwilling to sacrifice, you know, sort of their love of texting um, during church or something, texting during the time they should be at the synagogue simply because they see it as their right. Even when shown, and I'm going to make a prediction here, CEOs are going to have on their desks within the next few years a dollar value placed on bad smartphone habits. There's some who don't care. However, there's some who do. And they're the ones who would be asked to be responsible for the culture of unproductivity that they've introduced to their companies they're the ones who we need to be targeting. They're the ones who need to accept that the unproductivity has started with them and they need then in turn to examine their own habit patterns, make the changes that are necessary, put in place policies that can impact the entire company and impact its productivity. So there are only a handful of companies that I know of that have actually done, done this, who have put smartphone policies together to prevent smartphone abuse. So 37 Signals is a company, they have a, a website, uh, um, I think it's 37signals.com. Interesting company and they've recently made some changes. I have an article for, of it, um, on the changes they've made on my website, twotime-sys.com, where they only use, they don't interrupt each other by walking over and saying, hey buddy, how's it going? Because they know the cost that that incurs. Instead, they use IMs. So they have a policy of quiet, of giving, giving their uh, colleagues the respect that only quiet, sort of quiet, focused time 
can produce. Interesting. There are some companies, one company that at least I know of, and others also, after I did some research, I found they weren't alone. They've banned smartphones from board meetings. So you're going to get the irony of this. So they spent, let's say, 20 board members, um, 400 US, a smartphone. They spent how much money to purchase smartphones for each of their executives and all of their board members? They pay for all of their plans. After paying for it, and everyone came to their, you know, initial, imagine the first board meeting, everybody was all happy, oh my God, this is so useful, it's amazing, I can text my wife and tell her to take out the dog when I'm in the middle of the board meeting, you know, not a stupid thing from a strange place. <laughs> um, but what they found is that a bunch of bad habits cropped up, and I imagine that they tried to legislate the bad habits and say, okay, everybody put away your smartphones now, put away your Blackberries, because... No, we uh oh looks as if I have some a connection issue. It says my connection is lost. Hmm. I'm gonna put this on pause just so that I can check um my connection. Okay, it looks as if I'm back and I'm back on. My connection seems to be working fine. But anyway, so they, they tried to use a soft approach to get their employees to not use their smartphones. It didn't work. It got to the point where they had to make a rule. No smartphones in board meetings. But can you imagine, after spending all that money to make their employees more productive using smartphones, they had to end up banning. And these are not just employees. These are executives. This is the board of a major company. Irony. Huh. Another company has put in place what's called, well, they've experimented with no email Fridays, where no email is sent on Friday. Actually, this experiment didn't work. They tried to uh, implement no email Fridays. It just simply didn't work. They had to revert. So there's only a handful of companies that have seen the problem and have tried to put in place policies and procedures to change them on a large scale. This is amazing to me, given the amount of bad behavior and bad habits that people said to, uh, mentioned to me in the survey and the other surveys that I've read. I think the key here, though, is that when people talk about bad smartphone use, they tend to focus on the etiquette, you know, how rude it is, the hygiene, the, you know, the, the, the social graces, they don't focus on the dollar impact on the productivity. You know, changing the lines in the bank wasn't a function of etiquette or hygiene or community building. It was a, it was a hard dollars and cents issue. And once again, I'm going to predict that this is a hard dollars and cents issue. It's just not been converted to that yet. But we don't need to wait until someone presents us the proof. I mean, the damage is already occurring. I have a picture of a Trojan horse here. And I, I, as far as I can tell, smartphones have become a Trojan horse. A wasted time and effort. It's a way in which bad habits have snuck into your company sort of through the back door. My only hope is that common sense can prevail. Common sense can make a difference. Even before your CEO gets that report that shows him how much money he's wasting through bad smartphone usage. So I started off by saying there's two huge forces that are colliding in today's workplaces. One is that there's a recession, the other is that there's brand new technology, and all of these are outside of our control. We can't stop the recession on our own and we can't roll back the technology. But the fact is you don't have to surrender. You don't have to give up. Instead you can focus on change. And the three things I covered tonight, the individual focus, the insisting on real productivity, insistence on real productivity, and the challenging of executives or clients speaking truth to power are three powerful places to start. And if you can translate the damage that's being done in companies to the bottom line and show hard dollars, show some hard metrics, you'll be able to convince executives that the habit change that need is needed, needs to start, and it needs to start with them. You can actually save the day. 
have the clothes part. Be the one who rescues your company from bad smartphone habits. So thanks for paying attention. Thanks for being there. It's been great working with you. All the best. Go and change those smartphone habits. Bye-bye.